You've got to believe that Christ is the all satisfying, all pleasurable. You've got to believe that to know Jesus is far more gratifying to the soul than all the praises of man that you would ever get. Um, please turn to Mark 12. Mark 12, from we're reading today from verses um, 38 to, to verse 40. Mark 12, 38 to 40. And the title for this message is Beware of False Teachers. Beware of False Teachers. Back in the Garden of Eden, when that slimy, sneaky Satan planted that seed of doubt in Eve, how did he manage to do that? How did Satan manage to plant this seed of doubt in Eve? When you see pictures that are drawn about this, what do you normally see? You see a picture um, of um, a scary-looking snake wrapped around a tree or a, a terrifying uh, black man with uh, red horns, two red horns, a tail, and holding a pitchfork in his hands, and he's having a chat with Eve. Have you seen this before? Yeah? Well, I, I don't want to insult your intelligence by stating the obvious, but um, I don't believe Satan uh, appeared to Eve in a form of a scary reptile and that's how he tempted Eve. If you, if you ever um, get an ugly-looking snake, uh, want to have a chat with you, run fast, run far, and, and don't think twice about it. Otherwise, you're going to be in big trouble. Um, no. Satan loves to play dirty. The Bible tells us that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So he must have appeared as a harmless and attractive creature. He never denied the truth outright. He acknowledged the truth. He affirmed the truth. And when Eve put her guards down and left her heart exposed, only then that serpent of old cleverly twisted the truth, opened his jaws out wide and revealed his deadly fangs and swiftly punched holes in her spiritual skins and injected his venom of false teaching into her heart. How? By giving wrong interpretations for the truth by false application of the truth. And then he left Eve for dead. Satan has been in that work for so long. He's become the founder and the CEO of all false teaching, cunning skills and trickeries. Ever since then, Satan has employed millions Millions of false teachers in that business of luring people away from the gospel, away from Christ, and drawing them into the broad way that ends up in hell. Satan, his business of false teaching is booming. His shares have gone through the roof. I mean, forget about investing in bitcoins or gold. False teaching nowadays is skyrocketing from prosperity gospel, social gospel, seeker-friendly gospel, works-based gospel. Satan is getting richer every day by the day. Satan is also occupying a large real estate of church leadership. He has his faithful employees 
promoted to stand behind many pulpits and he's recruiting many and many more by the day. Yet sadly, many Christians, in the name of tolerance, and because they want to obey the 11th commandment, which doesn't exist in the Bible, of course, Thou shalt be nice. And the twelfth commandment, Thou shalt not judge. In the name of that, Christians are silent as Satan repeatedly stabbing the, the heart of the bride of Christ with much false teachings. And yet, God in His Word has not stopped warning us against false teachings. If the New Testament was a song, the warning against false teaching would have been the chorus. Every epistle waved a red flag against false teachers. Acts 20:29, 20, the scripture calls them savage wolves. Romans 16, 18, slaves of their own appetites. 2 Corinthians eleven fifteen, servants of Satan. Philippians 3, 2, dogs, evil workers. Jude 10, unreasoning animals. With many striking, condemning words, the scripture time and again strongly denounces these false teachers. So what do we have to do? We've got to beware of false teachers. Beware of false teachers. So with that being said, let's read now Mark 12, 38 to 40. And we look at the scribes who represent the false teachers at the days of Jesus, in his days. Verse 38, in his teaching, he was saying, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who devour widows' houses and for appearance's sake, offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Just to remind you in that previous passage, Jesus already began to be aggressive against the scribes, but specifically against the false doctrine of the scribe. He asked, if you recall in verse 35, uh, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? And, and we've gone through this and we've seen that Jesus is not only the son of David. No, Jesus is also the son of God who alone saves his people from sin and death. He's the personal, infinite God. He alone satisfies the heart with his presence. False teachings have their own varieties of filthy odor. We know that they come in all different flavors and colors. But one thing all false teachings have, one thing in common, is that they all oppose Jesus Christ. They refute, they deny Jesus Christ. Throughout history, the lowest common denominator of all the heresies that the church had to endure is simply this. Jesus is not God. And because He is not, therefore, on His own, He can't save you. For Him alone, you should not live. In Him alone, you can't be satisfied. 
Now, these are the implications of false teaching. And so Jesus went after the heart of false teaching. That was last message. That was last week. Now Jesus goes after the heart of the false teachers themselves. Who are the false teachers? What sort of character traits do, do they possess? In this message, I urge you, I, I urge you, ask yourself, am I giving myself to those false teachers? Or even worse, am I exhibiting some of those character traits? Am I going down the road of actually being a false teacher myself? God forbid that we would ever think that we're not vulnerable to either be lulled by them, drawn by them, or perhaps exhibit their character traits. We're vulnerable. And that's why we need to pay careful attention to what Jesus has to say in this message. The outline for today is this. <coughs> Caution against false teachers. Characters of false teachers. And number three, condemnation. A condemnation upon the false teachers. So we start with the first one. Caution against false teachers. In verse 38, it says, In his teaching, he was saying. So Jesus was doing what he loved to do the most. He was teaching, and it would have been a very large crowd. It was the Passion Week. Thousands upon thousands. We're talking millions of people were there gathered at the, in the temple. And Jesus was teaching. Now, when it says, in his teaching, it means that this is not all that Jesus taught. Mark here trimmed off everything and placed only the vital truth that Jesus imparted to his people. Now, now who was taught at that time? Mark doesn't tell us who Jesus was speaking to, but if you would uh, look at the corresponding passage in, Ma in Matthew and in Luke, they give us um, a more uh, detail. And they both would say that Jesus is addressing specifically his own disciples, but in the presence of the crowd, as well as, of course, the religious leaders who were hearing Jesus as he was um, addressing his own disciples. And what Jesus is about to say are the last words that will come out of his lips in a public gathering. No more will Jesus speak um, in a public after this point. Jesus, the great teacher of all time, after preaching and teaching for three laborious long years, he concludes his teaching by this imperative command that just shows us how important it is for us to pay attention to what Jesus has to say. And he says this, Beware of the scribes. He concludes these three years not by an evangelistic message, but by a warning. Beware of the scribes. Now this word beware means to be mentally alert. Have your eyes wide open. Beware. This is a strong word and it means to be vigilant, to be on the look out attentively at the coming danger. Watch out. This is a, a warning with a black flag and skulls and bones all over this flag. And the pirates in this ship are the scribes, false teachers. Beware of the scribes. Now, who are the scribes? It's important to um, revisit who these scribes are and 
understand how impactful they were at the time of Jesus to understand what he meant by that. Well, the scribes were the, if you recall, the human photocopiers of the Scripture at that time. They were the interpreters of the law of God. And they were looked upon as the guardians, the gatekeepers of the law. They were the legal experts. And most of the scribes belonged to the sect of the Pharisees. But they were considered to be the elites of, this, of those Pharisees. If a Pharisee needed to understand the passage or how a Pharisee would apply it or even to teach it, um, he would have to go and consult a scribe. So they were held in reverence by the common Jews. They were so respected. In fact, one historian once said, and I quote, All the people rose respectfully when a scribe passed by passed by, and the only tradesmen busy at their work were exempted. Another historian said, people were kissing their hands as a form of honor in full view of the public. So they were seen as uh, religious swans with their long necks and gliding among little sparrows of humanity. They were the elite of the elite. They were the religious golden champions of the law of God, understanding the law and applying the law and obeying the law. And they stood tall above all the try-hard spiritual athletes of the day. But what does Jesus do here? He publicly, right in front of them, he calls them out. And he denounced them with strongest terms. In fact, if you would look at the parallel uh, passage in Matthew, you would find that Jesus called them hypocrites, frauds, sons of hell, whitewashed tombs. Jesus. So unchristian of you, Jesus. You shall not judge. You're, 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 you're being too judgmental, Jesus. You've just broken the 11th command, Jesus. That's not nice. That's not nice. You know, can I say something? Do you know, being nice is not the same as being loving. That's totally different things. Jesus was not nice, right? He was not, but he was loving. It's for the sake of those Pharisees or those scribes, they needed to hear this so that they would repent. And for the sake of his disciples, they need to be warned lest they become like them. Listen, beware is an imperative command. To tolerate people, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing, it's a commendable. To be patient with people is a commendable thing. It's a virtue that we need to cultivate. But to tolerate false teachers is a disobedience to this command. It is a sin. And the scribes, like false teachers, they only were in it for popularity, for power, and prestige. False teachers are like savage wolves. They claim to protect the sheep, but in reality, they feed on the sheep. False teachers, not only are they corrupt, but they propagate the, the corruption that they have within and they destroyed so many people's lives as a result. Jude 23 says that we've got to hate even their garments that are polluted by their flesh. Second John 10 tells us that, um, that we must not receive them or listen to them or even greet them. We must never open our hearts or give our ears to false teachers. Whether Joyce Meyer, N.T. White, 
Joel Osteen, Benny Hinn, anyone that opposes Christ or his gospel. Jesus had zero tolerance to false teachers. And we too must have zero tolerance. <clears throat> so beware. Keep your eyes wide open. Have your spiritual antenna up. Beware, meaning don't listen to them. Don't imitate them. So that's the caution against false teachers. But then the question has to be asked, Lord, who are those false teachers? How do I know one when I see one? Or how do I know if I'm going down that road of being a false teacher? So Jesus is about to give five marks, five character traits that we measure false teachers against. So in the previous message, we saw <clears throat> the teaching of demons. In this passage, we'll see the teachers of demons. In the last one, we saw the damning teaching that is void of Christ. And now we see the damned teachers that are void of the personality of Christ and the virtue, virtues and the characters of Christ. So we come to the second point, the characters of false teachers. And we stay there for a while, by the way. Characters. There are five characters that mark the false teachers. The first one is that they parade themselves. They love parading themselves. They're focused on being noticed by men. So we continue, and Jesus says, Who like to walk around in long ropes? Now just pause there. The, you know, there's nothing wrong with wearing wrong, long ropes. Okay, um, there is no glory in coming to church with our worst clothes, looking like homeless people. There's no glory in that. Th th their problem was not that they wore long robes, right? Pay attention. Read the text. <laughs> They're saying here, Jesus saying, they like to walk around in long robes. It's about loving to walk around in long robes. Matthew 23, verse 5, which is an extension to this, it's referring to their tassels. You know, the tassels are loosely hanging threads. They knotted together at, 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 at one end, and they're loosed in the, in, at the end. Uh, in the other end, uh, Jesus commanded the Israelites to attach those tassels at, at the end of their clothes. Even Jesus himself wore t had tassels in his, in his clothes. And the purpose of these tassels, by the way, we find them in Numbers verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 40. It says, so that you may remember to do all my commandments and to be holy to your God. So the purpose of those tassels, it was a, an outward symbol, a reminder, if you like. Every time uh, you look at those tassels, you remember, oh, I've got to live for God. I'm dedicated to God. My entire existence is for God. But the scribes, they turned this symbol into an arrow pointing to themselves. And they used to wear these white linen robes. The you know white resembles purity, of course. And uh, those robes that reach to their feet, and then they attach to the bottom very long tassels. And they over time they kept on stretching these tassels to make it longer and longer. And they walked around dragging those tassels on the ground, looking like peacocks. Right? It's, it's, it's like a, a bride that is walking around with her wedding dress. It's, it is tiring, wouldn't it be? Right? Now, why did they do that? Well, the Scripture tells us 
that they did that. They do their deeds to be noticed by men. That's why they did that. It's a fashion show. It's a, it's a holy modeling, if you like. It's just a way to be the center of the attention. And they did that to impress people with their righteousness. It's kind of like saying, hey, look how long my tassels are. I, I, I must be holy. It goes well with my halo in my head. And the false teachers, they love parading themselves in front of men. They wear what they wear because they love to be admired by men. They want men to lick their sandals. False teachers are self-promoters. They're in that business of self-advertising. And, and they use godly means, the pulpit, clothes, whatever they get their hands on. They, they're just looking for a platform so that they will be on a spotlight. It's no wonder because if they don't focus on the splendor of Christ, then whose glory are they going to want to focus on, on their glory? <clears throat> it says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who's in heaven. So that's the first character trait. The second one, the second mark, character trait that marks false teachers is that they love the praise of men. They love to be praised by men. Continue reading. It says there, and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Of course, it, obviously, this has to be the second step. Why else would they dress up and look Funky like that. <laughs> uh, false teachers, they're, they're, they're good salesmen. And all their costumes and their godly effort, um, you could say is their investment. But the return on their investment is this. The respect, the honor, the praise of man. Matthew verse <clears throat> 23 verse 7, the extension of this again um, Jesus tells us that they love to be called rabbi, the supreme one, excellency, great one. In verse 9 of the same chapter, they also love to be called fathers, meaning leader, shepherd. Uh, these are titles of exaltation, if you like. And they love being addressed with these titles. Now, to put into the right perspective, I just want to say that it's not wrong to, to greet people with their titles. Sometimes it's rude not to. But if you are at the receiving end, if you love that, if you desire that, if you like it when people are calling you by those kind of titles, you're no better than those scribes that Jesus just condemned. And like respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Now, please note, since uh, this is a continuation of the, of the same sentence, um, the, the idea here is that, that the scribes, they uh, wear their robes and they take it with them to the marketplaces. In the marketplaces, of course, is where people are. It's most of the communities that they um, move away from their houses and they go to the marketplaces to buy and sell. If you're not a farmer in your land uh, plowing uh, and harvesting, you're at the marketplace. This is where you are. This is where you take your kids to help you to buy and sell. And so to maximize their fame and glory, these scribes, they flaunted their piety by intentionally going to the marketplace. And how do they go? They're all dressed up, chest back, noses up in the air. And, and you're kind of sitting there with your kids 
and, and you look from afar and he just ask, who's this dressed up like that? He must be an important person. Oh, it's Rabbi David or Father Samuel coming this way. Wow, doesn't he look holy with that robe? And you get your kids lining up and say, come on, kids, stand up quickly. You know, kiss his hand. You'll probably get a blessing when you kiss his hand. And then he comes closer to you and he says, Oh, good, good afternoon, most excellent Jeremiah. And the scribes loving it. They're lapping it up. Come on, give me more. Your pride is hungry for more of praise of men. And when they hear men respecting them, Greeting them this way, it's feeding their pride. John 12 verse 44 tells us that these leaders loved praise from men more than praise from God. Brothers, beware of such false teachers who love the praise of men. Don't listen to them. Don't be like them. Don't. Now, if this character trait was not bad enough, just have a look at the third one. The third character trait that marks false teachers. They love the positions of honor in the places of worship. Verse 39, Jesus continuing on and he says, and chief seats in the synagogues. It's getting from bad to worse, is it not? Now, false teachers are full of themselves. Now, chief seats in the synagogues, what does that mean? Well, in the synagogues back in the days of Jesus, they were similar to those church buildings, you know. Uh, they had an elevated platform at the front where uh, worship leaders uh, used to sit and they would face people just like what we do here. And uh, when prominent men used to come uh, and attend the worship service, they used to get asked to come up the front and sit on those chief seats that are on this platform, and they used to be asked to read the Scripture. And it was regarded like a place of honor, and it was meant um, that, um, that everyone would be able to see their faces and hear them speak. Now, some, some churches still do that. Till today, I'm sure many of you know this. One, one, once I was invited to one of those churches, and I was um, pretty much dragged up to the front, and I sat in those churches and uh, sat on those seats, and I was facing the congregation. It was very, very awkward. As, as the, the pastor of this church was taking photos and uploading into Facebook, Now, scribes crave for that. They crave for positions of honor. They drooled over public recognition. They loved being the icing on the cake. Now, of course, you, you, we need to understand this. They're not going to come and say, oh, we love these positions. No way. They read the Bible. They know what the Bible says. They're not stupid. But in their hearts, they want to crawl on top of each other and just to, to get on top and occupy those most prominent positions. And for the sake of their self-promotion, they would work the system and they work really, really hard to push their way up the ladder. Just to be seen and heard. They're like little kids who fight over a mic so that they would speak through it. The arrogance of false teachers, the big headedness of false teachers. How egotistic can they be? Even in the places of worship where the full dependence of God 
is to be expressed. And the love for God is to be sung. False teachers, while they're pretending to worship God with their lips, but their hearts are void of the love and the fear of God. Why? Because they're too busy thinking, how can I get a higher position, get a greater status, more recognition, the love, the position of honor. Number four, they also love to be privileged. They love to be privileged. Again, they love to be honored. And not only is Jesus saying that they like to sit in those chief uh, seats in the synagogue, but they also love to sit in the places of honor at banquets. Now, back in those days, banquets, you would have a, a, a table in the shape of a U, and sometimes or a circle, and the host would be sitting at the back center. And it will be guest of honors, and he would go and he would ask people to be guests of honors, one of them at the right hand, the other on the left hand, similar to what um, James and John asked Jesus. So can one sit at your right and one left? They're a guest of honors. They want to be the guest of honors. And the scribes love that. They love to sit the closest to the host, people who have the highest authority. You know, the scribes, it's not that they leave the synagogues and then they leave behind their pride. No, wherever they go, they are carrying with them that corruption from within. And all that they will be thinking about when they're invited to a banquet is, uh, who's inviting me over? What quality of dinner will be provided to me? Um, how are they greeting me? Oh, why is it they're honoring this man instead of me or more than me? You see, false teachers are full of themselves. It's all a me, 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 false religion with the appearance of godliness. But all they cared about is to be honored. To be privileged. Well, that's the fourth character trait. Now, all the above is one thing. The last sign, the last character trait is the most wicked and the most sinister of them all. The last character trait is their love for possession. Greed, greed. They crave for one more dollar in their pocket. And they, are, they love it so much that they're willing to trample upon the innocent and the defenseless just to get rich. We see that in verse 40. Jesus says, Who devour widows' houses? Devour widows. Remember those days, widows, they can't work. They couldn't work back then. This word devour, it's an intense, it's a strong word. It, it means intense desire. Sometimes the New Testament translates it to the word consume. It's desire for greed. And these scribes, they were meant to be teaching the helpless and protect the weak. But instead, they exploited these people. Terrible. And, and it's like, because Jesus wants to set them apart from the tax collectors and the outright thieves, because the bottom line is that they share the same heart as those tax collectors and those uh, thugs and thieves. But to set them apart from those tax collectors, Jesus continues on and he says, and for appearances' sake, offer long prayers. That the scribes were really good at working the system to their advantage. The scribes, 
that they would pray with one eye closed as to appear sincere and the other eye open just to look and see who they can scam next. And they abused their position to defraud the gullible. And many widows, they saw the scribes praying. Remember, they used to pray in the street corners, public places, just to be noticed by men. And so those widows would have seen those scribes praying, and surely, surely they heard how long and sophisticated their prayers were. And, and those widows um, would have looked at them, and they would have said, Oh, look how he prays. His hands are up in the air. His clothes are glorious. His words are long. And they are very hard to understand. Surely he's a man of God. Surely I can trust him with my money. He can protect my inheritance. And many scribes, they... They would abuse their office, and they cheated the poor out of everything they had. And many widows have become homeless, history tells us, because of those scribes. False teachers are like snakes. They're like sharks that appear in the form of dolphins. They're like black vultures, but from afar they look like harmless birds. Or like Jesus said once in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. They lurk around with lots of smiles and they cover themselves with a blanket of godliness and they circle around their victims and at the most vulnerable time, they pounce upon their prey. And for the love of money, they grow fat by tearing apart the simple one. At least the tax collectors were open up. They, they, were, they were honest about it. <laughs> and that's why those false teachers will receive greater condemnation. So we'll come to the third point. We've looked at the caution against false teachers. Beware. We looked at the characters of false teachers, and now we look at the condemnation upon those false teachers. Continuing on, Jesus says, these will receive greater condemnation. This is huge. Jesus is talking here. Make no mistakes. Greater knowledge of the truth leads to greater responsibility to uphold this truth. And if it's abused, it will bring greater condemnation. You know, some people falsely assume and they say, well, at least I go to church. Yeah, at least I work hard. Surely I'm going to earn a brownie point or two. Surely if I read the gospel or I pray, surely God will relent. Or maybe, just maybe, perhaps if I remain as an unbeliever, he will ease my punishment a little. Right? Yeah? I mean, better to die near the kingdom than to die far away. Yes? Better to die holding a Bible in my hands rather than holding a whiskey bottle. 
Let the words of Jesus ring in our hearts. These will receive greater condemnation. The higher you climb the ladder of knowledge and the ladder of influence, if the motives for you taking these upward steps were found to be praise of men, position of honor, possession, if lustful power, pride, profit-making are what driving you to climb this ladder, the harder you will fall. And the lower and the hotter the place in hell you will occupy. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus pronounced a terrifying judgment upon whom? The morally good, the morally upright unbelievers of his day, those who heard the gospel and rejected Christ. And Jesus basically said that their judgment is far more severe than the homosexual cities who never heard the gospel and died in their sin. Now, how much all the more severe will the punishment be upon the false converts who pretend to be Christians when they're not? And even beyond that, how much all the more severe the punishment will be for false teachers? who claim to have known the truth, pretend to have accepted the truth, and for selfish gain, they misinterpreted, misapplied this truth, and led many people to hell along with them. Jesus said in no uncertain terms, these will receive greater condemnation. Brothers, sisters, there's a reason why James even tells us, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren. Why? Knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. The false teachers are like demons wrapped in a Christian wrapping paper. Yes, when you read what was what is the, on the paper, you would find a good verse, a devotional book, some level of morality, a theological discussion. You will find all of that. But then what happens? You take this wrapping paper out, you scrunch it, throw it away, and when you get to the nitty-gritty, you know what you discover? Christ and his compelling glory does not exist. It's all a facade. It's all shame. Just a scam. False teachers, they find their identity and their sense of well-being not in Christ, but in being accepted by men. They're deceived and they think by parading themselves or praised by men, position of honor or possession, somehow they've got this that sense of security and satisfaction. Boy, are they wrong. And people like that destroy not just themselves, but people that are around them. Watch out from false teachers. Don't listen to them and search your hearts. If you see that you may exhibit any of these character traits. Well, to, to finish the, the message, I want to finish the message with asking this question. What should right teachers, true teachers look like? What should those scribes, 
have done at the time of Jesus. I want to look at their character traits and correct them in a lot of the gospel. I want to see the exact opposite of what we must be like. If we must not be like them, what must we be like? We start with parading themselves. Well, instead of them walking around with long robes, trying to make themselves look righteous and holy, they should have read the law that they are teaching and be crushed by that law. And they must have died by that law when they heard the law and then embraced Christ, the Savior, that the, that the very law that they taught was pointing to. Rather than being concerned by what clothes they wear and try to wave to people um, their self-righteousness, they should have seen themselves naked before a holy God and then begged Christ, would you cover me with your blood? They should have fled to Jesus Christ so that he would clothe them with his righteousness. Secondly, rather than seeking the praise of man, what should they have done? They should have believed all that the Scripture teaches about Christ. It begins with that. It begins with tr the true teaching. If you're a false teacher, where do you have to begin? How do you become a true teacher? You go back to the basic. You go and believe the true teaching. Embrace all who Christ is. Not only trust Him as though someone runs quickly um, to grab an antibiotic because you trusted that your healing will come from the antibiotic and then you put it back after you finish. Not, not the same way that you would trust a, a cough medicine, you know, I don't like the taste, but I guess I, I have to drink it. No. I just know what I mean by, by believing. You've got to believe that Christ is the all-satisfying, all-pleasurable. You've got to believe that to know Jesus is far more gratifying to the soul than all the praises of man that you would ever get. And when their souls are relished eating Christ, drinking Christ, they would have desired for Jesus to be so magnified, so exalted in their lives, and they would have concluded that Christ is worth living for. And so, no better title that they would have loved to have than to be called slaves of Christ. Slaves of Jesus. Every pulse and every heartbeat will be drumming, as Paul once said, for to us to live for Christ, to die is gain. And so they would have lived to the praise of God and not praise of man. Number three position of honor. What about that? Well, rather than being motivated by having a position of honor, they should have been convinced that no better position than to rest at the feet of Christ. And if Christ calls them to clean the toilet, wash dishes, pick up rubbish, their hearts should have cried, Jesus, I will do just that till my dying breath. Had they bathed in that doctrine of Christ and the beauty and the glory of Jesus, they would have said, 
for you, Jesus, my back would be a doormat for others to walk on to come to you. And if there are others, other brothers in here that are more influential than us, let our shoulders be their platform for our brothers to rise up so your name would be proclaimed more clearly. This would be our place of honor. What about being privileged? Being privileged. Well, true teachers, they don't care what people think of them. Not that they walk around disrespecting people. No. But they study the law. True teachers are good learners. They study the law. And they're convinced that no one will ever think low of them more than how low they really are in the sight of God. They even know that they themselves cannot think of themselves low enough in comparison to how truly they really are in the sight of God. But they're not troubled by that. You know why? Because they read the Scripture. They know that they're accepted by God in Jesus. They're loved by God before the foundation of the world, no matter how low or high they are, and because of Jesus, His blood, His redemption. God will never think, or sorry, treat the lower or higher than that blood speaks on their behalf. So they have the courage they have the courage to check their hearts and to see where they stand before God. And when other people criticize them, they say, is that all? Is that all that you think of me? <laughs> that's, that's not low enough. Let me tell you how low I am. And I'm not troubled by you. Why? Christ loves me. He died for me. He rose again to justify me and to declare me righteous. And that's enough for me. And if I am privileged enough to have Christ in my heart and I'm always in communion with Him, then it doesn't matter what people think of me. Being privileged. What about the last one? Possessions. Well, for possessions, you got to come back next week. <laughs> so we'll be talking about that next week. Continuation of that passage, the next passage, talks about money and possessions. Let's pray. Lord God, how terrifying that judgment is that you pronounce upon false teachers. We pray, Lord, that you will keep us protected from all the false gospels and false teachers out there. That you purify us, Lord. Set us apart for you, our Master. We don't want to be like those false teachers, Lord. We don't want to. We pray that our hearts will be exposed to the true gospel. And Lord, if, if you see any character traits of those false teachers, we repent, Lord, of these character traits. We repent. May we live every moment for Christ. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen.